Old World Florida. Old World Florida. Old World Florida. Dude, I'm telling you, dude. Dr. Narco Longo came on and dropped the hammer of the guy. America's mother, daughter of Atlantis. God sent the weatherland. The devil sent the Spanish. Florida is Eden, the phantom of Newton. Kali is deception. So Florida is the truth. Welcome to Florida, baby. What's up, guys? How's everyone doing out there? Let us know how our audio is sounding as you file in. Give us a thumbs up if we sound good, if our levels sound good. I've got some changes I can make here, if not, so no worries. But happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. We've got my favorite Irish man here, We've a uh, familiar face of the channel. We got Al Diggity Dog himself, author of the Charter. Okay, you know the the greatest way to exit mass hip hop hypnosis, hip hop gnosis, right? You know, but yeah, he had a bit of a viral uh, rant, you know, or kind of quip earlier, where he basically stated the truth, and the truth is that there's a conversation that needs to be had about some of the greatest when it comes to sports and things like that. But Al Dog, thank you very much. It's the proper day for this conversation. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. I'm very happy to be here. I'm really excited to get into uh, the subject tonight. This is one of my favorite subjects, something I'm really looking forward to learning quite a bit about. We're going to be talking about the Irish, the Phoenicians, Connor McDarry and its connections to the Old and New Testament. This is unprecedented. I'm yep. stoked to be here. This is going to be a legendary stream on a legendary day. Um, yes. Should I get into like I'm at 500,000 views, half million on uh, on Twitter right now. That's amazing. Yeah. Should we tell the people what I went off on? Or? That's amazing. I mean, do you have it up? Like, could we play it? I yeah i could probably play it yeah yeah on your instagram um, yeah we can because dude i did that rant in like one take just off the cuff just like fucking i was at a cafe and i'm like you know what the saint patrick's day spell of all the alcohol and the binge yeah. drinking it needs yeah. to be addressed because the real truth <clears throat> is really worth talking about um should i send you the tweet or should I just... You know what? Screw the tweet. You yeah. rip, let her rip. You know what okay. you said. Okay, so St. Patrick's Day. What do you guys think about a bunch of people wearing green and they're binge drinking alcohol? And uh, so there's been this stereotype developed where oh, Irish people drink a lot, or Irish people are supposed to drink a lot, and it's it's a disgusting spell and it's completely unacceptable, and it it needs to end right here, right now, on the Old World Florida channel with Doctor Narco Longo. And the Al Diggity Dog. And why does the spell need to end? I'll tell you why. Because when when Irish people don't drink, okay, they're the best athletes in the world in every single sport. 
I repeat, the best in every sport. Don't believe me? This list is going to shock you. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Narco Longo, who, who do you think is the best surfer ever? Let's just start there. I mean, I don't know shit about surfing, but yeah. I know that it's Kelly Slater, you know. Factually correct. Let's yeah. say, who's the, okay, oh, G Wiz, he happens to be Irish. Best surfer ever, Irishman, Kelly Slater. Who's the yeah. best skateboarder ever? Hmm. Tony Hawk. Tony Hawk had his wedding in Ireland, Irishman. Wow. We're just getting wow. started. We're just, yeah. This list is, dude, it's, I thought I had a big list, but it's every single yeah. sport. I, I love how you're starting off with like the, uh, the extreme yeah. sports. Like, oh, is that all we got? Tony Hawk and, you know. Dude, this list is going to shock people because this needs to be talked about. Okay. In your opinion, Dr. Narco Longo, who's the greatest football player ever? Tom Brady. Irish. Wow. Shocker, right? Mm-hmm. Who was, uh, who's the most recent NCAA football national championship quarterback? The correct answer is J.J. McCarthy, also Irish. Brock mm. Purdy, also Irish. That's just football. Who built the fucking UFC with charisma? Conor McGregor. Uh, yeah. So now we got, dude, <laughs> we got surfing, so, uh, surfing, uh, skateboarding, football, uh, the UFC, the most charismatic guy ever, all Irish, okay? Yeah. Who's the best golfer the last 10 years, easily, bar none? Rory McElroy. Okay. They used to have a Tiger Woods PGA Tour video game. They renamed it after Rory because he's better. Also Irish. Okay. The best NHL player in the NHL currently is Connor McDavid, also Irish. Wow. One of the best skaters ever is Patrick Kane, also Irish. Basketball. Okay. Oh, do, 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 uh, fucking Irish people don't play basketball. Please. My personal cousin. Pat Connaughton, uh, NBA champion, was in the NBA dunk contest. You guys can look this up. Has one of the highest vertical leaps in NBA combine, uh, NBA rookie combine history. Has highest one of the highest vertical leaps. People can look that up. Ever okay? Um, he also get he also got drafted into Major League Baseball. So he's one of the best athletes out there. Period. Right now. Um, so yeah, we got basketball covered too. Okay. Um, baseball best ever. One of the best ever Nolan Ryan, greatest swimmer ever. Gee whiz. Another Irish person. All the goats are Irish. Every single one Irish slash Atlantean Michael Phelps. Wow. Who's the only dude. It's, it's ridiculous. The only it's overwhelming dude, the only, uh, relevant heavyweight boxer the last 10 years, Tyson Fury, gee whiz, also Irish. The best one of the Podrick Harrington is worth mentioning as a golfer, but let me ask you who are the greatest lacrosse players ever? Oh, well, that's easy Casey Powell, number one, Mikey Powell, probably number two, and some would, and Ryan Powell's also considered one of the best. Three, three brothers from, from New York, I believe. Yeah, and do you know what their ancestry is by any chance? They are Irish, Welsh. Yeah. <laughs> Ross too? Like Yeah. Dude, and they oh. are I've met them. I've shaken their hands, dude. They're beasts. Dude, okay, honorable mention the Black Irish. Cuz these guys are part yep. Irish. You guys can look it up. Oh yeah. Muhammad Ali, Derek Jeter, part Irish, go figure. Um wor worth mentioning is Sean Kelly, <laughs> cyclist. But it's every single fucking sport and uh yeah, so when when Irish people don't drink alcohol, that spell needs to end. They become the greatest at every single yeah. sport. Yep. Now, so. Alex, a hey, I've got a few I can add to that list. Yes. Well said, Al Dog. I mean, you know, that's what that's what Al Dog brings to the show, guys. Mm -hmm. He's he's our eye into the the sports world, the athletic world. You know, where else are you going to get this stuff? And we spice astrology into it too. Come out and check the uh, Astro Chads premiering the 22nd, I believe. Al and I and some buds are going to be doing teaching astrology, teaching, you know, Aries, all about Aries. We're going to start off with. But my buddy Alex, shout out Alex Landry. 
Ireland soccer team is ranked 55th in the world. Now that's funny. And, yeah, it is. That's cool. And uh, I'll tell you why that is. Because in Ireland, you find Irish people perhaps don't hang don't hang me for this Irish people at their most restricted, inhibited, you know, beaten down. Irish people in America are like, I took over the world. Like we made it. We we fixed a country. We you know we escaped and prospered. So Irish people in America, it seems like they have more metaphysical breathing room and empowerment, and they stay off the the booze more than the real Irish do. So you you don't get that silly, um, you know, you don't get that silly goon culture or whatever they call it. The goon like pub culture in Ireland where they're just beating on each other and. You know, Did I, I'm sure I, there's great Irish athletes. You know, yeah. Al Dog, a whole other angle you could take this is the narrative that Irish women are ugly or the narrative that Irish people are not good looking. You know, almost all of the best looking people to have lived. And this whole discussion for another time, because it's completely different to, you know, like athletic value. But, you, you know, I, if you name some names, Cillian Murphy, whatever that guy's, however you say his name, like, you know, Brad Pitt, part Irish, right? Whatever. But then you've also got, and I wanted to add one to to your list, okay. Vince, Vince McMahon. <laughs> Beast, the genetic Vin, jackhammer. Vince McMahon, dude. Ken Shamrock. <laughs> yeah, also Ken Vince Shamrock, dude. dude. Ken Shamrock. Christian McCaffrey, the best running back in the NFL by far. Like, yeah. It's insane. No group even comes close. You know, other groups try their best, but the goat, all the goats are Irish. Sorry, every single one. We don't have time for games. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to touch on soccer. Soccer, the issue with soccer and why Americans genuinely don't respect soccer is because um, you have this culture of diving and rolling on the ground and crying, and it's really dishonorable. So yes. I, I love soccer. Yes. Good like point. I love playing soccer, and I think it's a beautiful game. But when I turn on a match and I see the best players on the world fucking rolling around and crying, yep. do you think Americans respect that? Are you fucking kidding no. me? No. No, the Irish are hot blooded too. So they like they like to you know Che Guevara. You know this is something else. Where where did the where did the uh, you know. Cuban, where did the brains and the bronze for the Cuban uh, rebellion come from? Yeah. Che Guevara, Irishman. Fact. Why do you have that big Fact. beard? You know, or why did he, why did the leaders have the facial hair? They had more European heritage. So you've got Che Guevara, who really was the face and the passion behind it. You know, people didn't so much care for fidel didn't catch on like che did but blah 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 that's unrelated but still there's Such there's a whole video on that there's a huge video on that of the irish mercenary uh presence in the world in like mm -hmm. every you know continent at one point irish mercenaries were were sought after and yeah, for sure. South America, especially filled with with Irish mercenaries who got pushed out for one reason or another and just excelled. And yeah, the French too. a lot of the early French, you know, the French have a lot of Gaelic blood uh, themselves. I hate to hate to admit it, but um, whatever. That brings us to another good point. Rome, the Roman Empire, you know, the French have Gaelic or Gallic celtic ancestry why are they different from the irish well they they mixed in with rome they took rome's culture they took a lot of rome's genetics you see a lot of brown hair brown eyes in uh france and shorter people but blah 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 church of atlantis people saint patrick's day the sunday service we've discussed you know the irish supremacy in yes. American athletics, world athletics. And um, when you include a lot of, when you, when you go to music and you, you know, you include a lot of those Irish guys, 
check out my hidden Irish history of America video, Jamaica, you know, um, what's the other one? Uh, uh, the real native Americans, that one, like the yeah. ancient Irish in America, I believe it's called. Yeah. But basically, you know, Bob Marley was an Irish, I don't think, but he was part English. So you have all these guys are mixed, you know, so, so often do, do, does black America just like discount their Irish ancestry, like case in point, Shaquille O'Neal. Hello. Valid. You know, you mentioned him earlier. You had to, right? No, I did. <laughs> you didn't, you didn't bring him up. No. <laughs> oh, well, Shaquille O'Neal. I mean, Hey, that's an Irish giant. If I've ever seen one. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, it's, I gotta, I gotta mention uh, this really important tidbit about Che Guevara because I've read his books. Okay. All these left wingers, all these right wingers haven't done the reading. I can guarantee that mm -hmm. because Che Guevara would brag about being uh, Irish. And I believe it was uh, Spanish, like a royalty bloodline. So people think Che Guevara, oh, he's this evil communist. No, he was a monarchist in my opinion. And yeah, he was part Irish and he was pretty violent to be honest with you. And like a lot of the killing he did in the name of communism, I think he just liked killing and I think he was a monarchist. Yeah. Um, but that's so important that you mentioned that. Cause I didn't know that you knew that. Like I, not that many people know that about that guy. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Yeah. That, that was in my, the hidden Irish history of America video. Talk about a lot of the military history of South America and Irishmen forging empires that no one's, you know, no one recognizes they were Irish people, but whatever. Peter Tosh, someone saying was Irish, lots of philosophers. Yeah. Apparently some of the most literate, one of the most literate nations too. And that's not like, I'm not saying literacy rate. I'm saying percentage of like my brother tells me cab drivers who have read all of Finnegan's Wake and James Joyce and, you know, the average person is a deep, deep reader in Ireland. I've been there when I was when I was super young, but one second, I gotta, gotta let my girlfriend in the cool. front door. I'll hold it down while he's away, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> the connection between Ireland and Atlantis is something I find really fascinating. The first uh, name that comes to mind is, uh, of course, Ignatius Donnelly, right? Legendary <laughs> Irishman. Sure, yeah. Okay, here, this will crack you up. You mentioned the vertical. Your cousin has one of the highest verticals ever yes. in an yep. NBA. NBA, okay. NBA rookie combine history. Yeah, he's like third highest, at least. Now, I got to throw it in here. When, when else will I get a chance to talk about this? Um, this will crack you up. I am, you know, congratulating myself. Like two weeks ago, my brother texted me out of the blue. Remember when you had the highest vertical out of anyone at the Team Florida Combine? Dr. Longo. Let's okay. Go. You know, one of the guys there who's also like an Irish giant, one of the goalies was six foot seven. So I still jumped higher than that guy. Wow. Pretty good. And, you know, my dad could jump way higher. My dad could dunk. My dad was six foot f f flat. Like it just, you know, and he could smash that thing like every time, not, it was crazy. And he was like, he was like a little overweight and everything. Wow. Crazy. He could dunk on command like a black dude. And yeah, I had no clue. I've never trained for vertical, never trained for any like, you know, band resistance training i only did what our school teams made us do you know for working out but team florida there was like a thousand kids there dude there's like a thousand like lacrosse players from all across the state and i not even trying to i had the highest vertical at the whole place so substantial so i'm irish i'm 50 percent irish so there's there's an elasticity to the, uh, who knows, whatever. It's something. You're... 
What is Instant. your theory on uh, the Irish athleticism? Why is it that every single sport uh, has an Irishman at the very, very top? Hmm. <laughs> you know, without being, without being like dismissive of other theories, I would say what jumps out to me, Irish people are different from all Europeans. How? or most Europeans how they have the most either Atlantean or native American ancestry. And you'll see today that most American sports come from a native American ancestor. So basketball, football, um, rugby comes from Europe, but they had rug versions of rugby here. They had lacrosse. Of course they had stick hockey, you know, they had equivalents. All of these were established in the Americas. The NBA, almost as it's played today, was being played in South and Central America, probably in North America too, but they had ball courts like that, big hoop, you know. And then you had lacrosse. I grew up playing lacrosse. That's almost exactly how they used to play. The sticks are almost the exact same. It's just modernized, but you're doing the same thing. It's sport is like light warfare is how the Native Americans called it warfare light like diet warfare and to me the irish have the richest history of crossing into the americas that's not acknowledged but to me that's how i look at it native americans were mixing with irish people more than any other race in uh, in europe that's why you see a lot of sloped foreheads in ireland despite you also see this big cranial capacity in a lot of Irish people like Brendan Gleeson, Matt Damon, you see a John C. Riley, you see just like this, just like oafish giant brain, you know, sinking down on the head. You see that almost exclusively with Irish people. You see this like giant brain <laughs> type looking person. But then also I think it goes, it mostly comes down to the, slight native american ancestry that they might have a slight ancestral connection to some of these more american sports then also i would say that they have the irish have some of the best fields and pastures for like just all out sprinting and evidence of this would be that when the native americans we you know we're having hostilities with with the Americans, the Irish and Scottish and Welsh were some of the people most likely to mix in, get absorbed into, and like adopt native lifestyles. Case in point, the Seminoles adopting a shit ton of Irish, Scottish, the Cherokee did for sure too. You know, a lot of these chiefs had like Irish names, you know, Osceola, Billy Powell, Osceola's birth name or his, you know, legal name was Billy Powell. That's the most famous Native American in Florida's history, Osceola. That's FSU's mascot <laughs> is wow. an Irish, Scottish, you know, culturally Irish, Scottish, Native American. And that's the history right there, FSU, you know. They, they, they drew from that with, you know, there's... Who knows? Uh, to me, that's what I look to is a slight familiar familiarity genetically with Native American games. That's my guess, because, you know, it would be too easy to just say we're better in every way. We're taller, we're smarter, you know, the Irish are better. That's too easy and that's too, you know, self-indulgent. But I would yeah. say s slight Native American ancestry. That's pretty cool. And there was the, clear connection. The Powell there. brothers, you know, the most native sport is lacrosse. Yeah. And it's three brothers from an, you know, Welsh family who are the biggest lacrosse guys around. It, not even close. Like you have average dudes from like the Northeast who make up the bulk of lacrosse players. Then you have legit Native Americans from the reservations who are a million times better than like all the white people and they they just sit really really close to the goal 
and they're just like they're just insane <laughs> insanely like quick and some of them are are fat as hell some of these native american guys are like not at all in shape they're not a runner they can't run up and down the field like like some of these white guys are like stallions going up and down the field and then the native dudes just sit right next to the net and they're just like wizards of of trickery like they just trick the goalie and that's their whole thing and the case the case the powell brothers are even better than those dudes the powell brothers are even better than the legit native americans who are on the reservation playing you know uh, this is like the lacrosse stick for anyone that doesn't know you know throwing the ball back and forth that's what it looks like but um to me it's the powell brothers are, are the best example to me you know i grew up playing lacrosse i met one of them and they're so talented it's they're not because lacrosse is not lacrosse is not a power sport like there's hitting it's like hockey like you can be chubby you can be five foot four you can be you know any shape and not run a sprint and still be the best player but the powells they are athletic and they're still better than those freak like talent guys and yeah so it's you know it's unique go check out lacrosse guys if you like native american history you don't like football you, you want to watch a sport that i can guarantee you isn't rigged because no one's watching you know and no one's like there's not big money behind it from israel or anything um lacrosse that's a big one it's got hits fights you know agility like extreme speed like high lie level speed you know the ball goes 115 miles an hour you know in, in any given professional game the ball's gonna break 100 miles per hour whatever and the irish have like an equivalent the irish have a history of, of stick ball it's oh, wow. not yes exactly it's not exactly um like a field hockey it's a field hockey type thing they do too and it's uh not exactly lacrosse but you can see where like they have a native link whatever but we're going to be talking about the bible enough sports sports is good it's sunday sunday's all about worship being in the sun athleticism you know i recommend working out on sundays and tuesdays to me that's when you'll get the most fire and energy and things like that but since we've established irish you know supremacy here only kidding youtube um basically i want to get into some other myths about irish people we, we touched on you know irish people being lazy drinkers or like chubby you know bar bar dwellers that's not true they excel in sports and really the only argument you can use against the irish in sports is saying that well they're the biggest ethnic group in in america just about you know it's close with germans but they're overrepresented you know what i mean but that's just not true because you have extreme cases of talent like the powell brothers etc where there's no demographics at play you know and like lacrosse whatever so we touched on the athletic athleticism we touched you know it's irish excellence month people it's irish pride month irish history month and irish history day pride day so we've got to ladle it on a little thick but touched on irish people being beautiful you know not ugly even though they can get ugly you know they, they've got that big head yeah that's the isaac taylor was this toponymist who had a lot of interesting theories like about the Finns and the irish and his whole theory was based off of head shape and size and the celts were or labeled as the original Aryans, these the original proto like Indo-Europeans, because they had big heads and tall heads, and that Nords and like Anglo and Germanic types had tall and thin heads, 
and then other tribes had like small heads you know small this but the irish and the celts were unique for having large heads and tall so wide and tall okay <laughs> big heads big headed people right big ego i guess a lot of pride the irish if you ever want to you know humble the irish a little bit humble irish americans go listen to thomas Sowell. um talk about how like negro gang culture like black american thug culture is was like a rip off you know monkey see monkey do situation <laughs> of, <laughs> of um, <laughs> um um irish like behavior in the south that the irish were so uh causing such a ruckus and were so gang oriented and behaving poorly that they're that slaves emulated that and saw it as how to act in white culture. And there's something to that, you know, there is something to that, but I'm only teasing a little bit. So, so there's something else Irish that I wanted to get over, I wanted to dispel a myth that needs to be done away with this whole notion that St. Patrick was the bad guy. That St. Patrick was, oh, we, we were just leading up to it perfectly, actually. Here, I'll read these tips. Thank you, guys. Instant defense, 10 bucks. Appreciate it. Tom Waits, Rain Dogs, Shelia. Ossostian. Doc, I bounced around similar channels, and I totally appreciate how hard you work. Videos every couple days. Thank you. I'm trying, man. I can do better. He's got that yeah. Irish work ethic. German work ethic, dangerous okay. combination. Okay, Irish, Irish creativity and uh, German. Are you part German, or is it just yeah. a mentality? Oh no, I'm German. Yeah. Okay. So, my guys, my name's very Irish. Yeah. My real name. If you if you unravel it, piece it back together, fifty percent Irish with a little Welsh in there, and then my mom's side. That's my dad's side. Very Irish. My mom's side is almost entirely German with a little bit of, you know, English put in there. Mm -hmm. But she's like Saxon. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. half Irish. My mom's side's Irish. My dad's like uh, more Nordic waspy sort of Shell, like, yeah. makeup. That's good stuff, man. A lot, you know, yeah. full full dose of Irish is, is can be a little risky, you know? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's going to get sort of Leo in nature if I would have if I were to describe it astrologically. Well, people describe uh Irish people as very Aries. Hello, right in the name, you know, airy, eerie, I iron, iron <clears throat> rules Mars rules iron, which is um aggression, things like that. And the Irish are known for having a quick temper so short fuse but thanks asosogen you're welcome appreciate you dude girl my dude whatever rock and roll 19 bucks no message appreciate it kroom what's up jc another irishman here my buddy jeff from the garden of eden in florida Thanks, man. Okay. So let's get into it. St. Patrick. Not, not evil. Not the destroyer of all things Irish. Okay. Not the man who forced Ireland to go Christian. Not the man who executed a an extinct race of pygmy you know, black pygmies, like people think this is the biggest myth there's ever been told about Ireland is that the Irish people there today are fake. And, you know, what do they say? Um, incubator babies, you know, that white people are just a recent addition to the British Isles. And that originally there was a flourishing race of pygmy black people. 
Is that real? Is that a real myth? <laughs> that's a real that's a real theory. Dude. Are you shit me? That's I, funny. Like half of people in the truth, like conspiracy sphere, think that St. Patrick is a story. Oh, you know, the serpents was actually some we some actually was Kangs. There was Kangs in Ireland and St. Patrick kicked them out. And that the whole story of the serpents is really black pygmies being painted as the bad guys as serpents and kicked out and they say and they say there's no evidence of of um serpents or snakes in ireland which is true and they say so it's fake story so they must be talking about black pygmies you know Dude. and they always show this picture of a black pygmy from africa Standing next to a white dude, and then everyone thinks it's in Ireland, and this myth persists so bad. Dude, they should definitely make that myth a cartoon because that'd be awesome. Look it up. Wow. And so, just you know, right off the cuff, I don't have too much prepared on that, but Saint Patrick, not a bad guy. At the very least, Patrick means Jupiter, Peter. Potter, Patrick, Podrick became Patrick. You know, pa Patrick means like a father. Patronize, you know, patriarchal. Patrick, that's father, Jupiter. So Peter, Jupiter, Patrick. It's the same origin. They have, you know, Patrick is almost in every single Indo-European language has a version of something a podrick somewhere around there and at the very least astrologically it's just a jupiterian archetype represents christianity you know yes overtaking the paganism the neptunianism the serpents the sea serpents the snakes whatever your interpretation is but um so yeah just real quick that's not true that's some we was kang's bs and you know i'll Tell it how it is when I need to. And if black people were in a country that people don't talk about and they were there, I'll talk about it. But this whole, you know, undermining Irish history has got to stop, obviously. And, you know, just that aside, like I said, I don't have too much prepared on that. But a big myth that I want to get rid of, want people to be done with is that Ireland is somehow a bitch for becoming Catholic. And I was saying this to you before we went live. People's, a lot of people in the truth community or Christian, you know, Protestant community or anyone who's kind of found the truth and is uh, keeping an eye on like, religion as something that they're you know is inhibiting them from going one direction people always say well why did ireland swallow catholicism so easily you know wh where's the irish pride where what's so good about them if they just became i you know catholic like like uh you know any other country or spain italy you know why would they turn their back on other northern europeans like that why would they it submit to rule from Rome, you know, isn't that the biggest exposing there is to be affiliated with the Pope and taking your orders from the Pope? And well, there's a whole angle to this that people don't know about. Okay. Oh man, someone got my name. <laughs> someone worked it out. Whatever. Um, Christianity either came from Ireland or was present in Ireland way before any, you know, Middle Eastern replicating came, any Middle Eastern um, plagiarisms, ultimately, uh, if you want to look at it like that. But it could just be that, yes, Christianity is timeless and it's in the universe it's written in the stars you know the cross is ever present you don't need christ to forge any of this stuff and basically 
people need to look at Christianity dif differently. I see comments here already. Okay. Enough with the Abrahamic stuff. Abrahamic, you know, don't you know that it comes from, you know, Jews? You know, did they, Judaism, then branch off into Christianity, then branch off into, you know, what we have today? That's not true, people. That is one of the biggest lies told today. And it's not just a lie. It's a misunderstanding. It's a fundamental misunderstanding of where Christianity comes from. We're getting told in schools, so I don't blame people, that Christianity is merely an outcropping of Judaism. Right? That Jesus was Jewish, then Jesus died, and then they became Christians. And then they've been at odds ever since. Right? Now, what if I told you that Christianity is Druidic wisdom, is ancient Irish wisdom? What if the Celtic cross is older than the Jerusalem cross? What if many of these words and places, names of places, were present in Ireland? What if the pharaohs were the pharaoh? What if the Hebrews were the Hebrides? And these, this, you know, I like my word play, but there's more to it than that. It's not just some names that sound alike. There's entire books that have been written on this that that uh, the Pope, that the Vatican have tried to stamp out so hard that you've never heard of. People have never heard of. You know, Al's heard of them. Uh, some some of my buddies have heard of them. I think some of you guys have, if you're into this stuff. Uh, who's ever heard of Connor McDarry? Well, he's going to do a better job of summing it up than I can, right? This is not my expertise, but it's something I love getting into. Connor McDarry wrote a book called Irish Wisdom Preserved. I think that's what it's called. Irish Wisdom Preserved in the Bible and the Pyramids. Here, I'm going to pull it up here. Um, Irish Wisdom Preserved in Bible and Pyramids from Hyksos by Connor McDory, 1923. Connor McDory, look him up. You almost can't find a picture of him. But basically, we're going to pull this up here. And this is going to dispel a lot of myths. Number one, Christianity, although grouped with the Abrahamic religions, is more timeless and ancient than both Judaism and Islam. The cross is more ancient. The, the character of Christ is more ancient. All of these things go back way farther than Judaism. Okay? Christianity is not an outcrop of Judaism. He's going to show this, and I hope I'm going to sprinkle in some more of what I found you know, elsewhere outside of this. But we're going to read this together, guys. This is Sunday service. You're going to love these angles. It's going to open up a whole new perspective into Christianity. Number one, this is something I also wanted to say. All pagan and indigenous truth is contained within the Bible. All these neo-pagans out there, all these people who think that they're fighting, you know, Zionism by fighting Christianity are fighting a fool's game. All pagan and indigenous truth is contained within the Bible. People say, oh, Christians went to all these indigenous lands and took away all the indigenous wisdom. No, 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 no. Our indigenous wisdom from our indigenous lands triumphed because it was truer. And if it wasn't truer, it absorbed and outlived, you know, outperformed whatever indigenous wisdom was out in some rainforest you've never heard of. I can guarantee you it's all in the Bible. You're not missing anything. You know, each continent, each group of people, each empire has their their method of accessing enlightenment. Christianity is no less equipped than Buddhism or Hinduism or any of these things. It's a fool's game to 
think you're going to go to India and attain enlightenment. It's right there in the Bible, all you need. And best part is, it's not a product of Judaism. So we're going to get into that. But I wanted to make that point too, that indigenous wisdom, you know, it's not just Abrahamic faith that we're, that we're dispelling here. It's also, you have, like I said, these whole, all these pagans and, oh, I have Nordic ancestry and Christianity. You know what Christianity did to my ancestors? They erased all the pagan wisdom. And uh, I don't think so. These people are just too triggered to have a good look at the Bible, ultimately. Their dad dragged them to church too many times when they were young and they can't get over it. Uh, this is what I find almost daily when people come into the bookstore and have a, you know, scoff at Christ, the Christian section. Uh, our Christian sections bigger than the Hinduism and the Buddhism section. Why? Because it's probably more, more worth looking into, right? And they write better books. But yeah. So yeah, we're going to dig into this great book. It's on archives.com if you want to get into it. But we're going to skip over to like page 50 to the chapter titled chapter five, the Bible as an Irish book altered and adapted by British Roman transcribers. Now, Connor McDory makes the argument that uh, Connor McDory makes the argument that Ireland surrendered in a deal with Rome, saying we will take your religion in name, but we will get to carry on all our pagan traditions, and you will not exert military control over Ireland. Britain took the other deal. We will keep a Protestant religion, or we will go our own way, but you will have unspoken rule financial economic control over our country so they sold out financially and kept the guise of a you know independent spiritual nation the church of england right ireland took the other route politically militaristically independent from the vatican but yes they use their their symbols now why if you go, if you look recently for the answer, in more recent times, you'll see that oh, these fucking ladies are so annoying. Pulling on the door, <laughs> obviously locked. Um, the more recent you look for an answer as to why Irish people are Catholic, you'll see people saying, um, I forgot what I was going to say. Whatever. I'm just going to read from this. You know, this guy's smarter than I am, people. Connor McDory. So we'll just look to him. Okay. Chapter five The Bible as an Irish book altered and adopted, adapted by British Roman transcribers. So, everyone ready to dig into this? Al, you ready? Anything you want to? I'm really stoked for this uh, McDory knowledge here. Cool. Although our Christian peoples in the mere advanced countries of today have denounced Jewish pogroms and deliberately planned murders of Jewish people in some of the countries of Eastern Europe during the World War, what can they think of the wholesale deportation and murders and suffering inflicted upon the people of what is now called Syria when they knew what the Roman Church put her plan in operation? to charge them with having crucified the ideal savior, Jesu, the sun god, and scattered them, scattered them broadcast over the world. By dispersing these people, she cleared the way for the remaining of places in, sorry, it's a little far from my, I'm looking at the screen here. She cleared the way for the renaming of places in Judea, to make it appear that such a man as Jesus had lived there, that these various places said to have been the scenes of his life and travels were actually real places and existence 
and in existence on the map with these names. It is something awful to contemplate. But the Roman church did this thing, and the people whom she punished thus, and who bear the undeserved stigma to this day for crucifying the Savior, are as innocent of such a deed as the child unborn. The Roman fathers employed most ingenious methods to establish the authenticity of Jesus to that. To that end, they had stories written up, written up purporting to be by certain men, some of whom denied his godlike powers, while there were other witnesses who declared that he worked wonders. Her scribes also wrote up accounts of those who were supposed to be his companions, but written in such a way that their stories would not agree in every minute detail, but near enough so that it would not appear that one account was a copy of the other. It must be as a witness, giving a different and distinctly individual narration of the facts, as seen by himself. These trained fabricators considered that no two or more persons would write the facts regarding an event in real life in just the same identical words. So it was thought best to have a little variation inserted in the accounts as given by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So that is how we find it arranged in those four books by the Roman doctors. If Luke tells of an event in one way, John tells it a little differently. And so with Matthew and Mark. Luke records the miraculous draught of fishes was made at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. John says that it did not happen until after he had risen from the dead. John says that although the number of fish was great, the net was not broken, and Luke says that their net did break. Matthew says that Jesus told the twelve apostles to go and preach, and commanded them to, quote, provide neither gold nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves. Is there a shit ton of noise in the background? Not really. It's just some like chair dragging and it's kind of over. Other than that, it's all good. There's some wigger in a sports car. Nor yet staves. Mark is made to mention the same incident, just a little bit different and with a slight contradiction of his infallible brother scribe. He says that Jesus commanded them to take nothing for their journey, save a staff only. Like in like inconsistencies, which are so many in these four Gospels, stamp them as counterfeit books. In fact, the very names of the authors to whom these books are ascribed are forgeries and misleading. They were intended so to be, for it was claimed that they were Hebrew while the plain truth is that they were taken entire from the ideals of the Irish Gospels, with the nomenclature slightly changed in order to escape detection. It is not my purpose to give an extreme elucidation or explanation of the Bible in this chapter or work, but as the Irish Bible and Irish Great Pyramid of Iessa are closely related in spiritual and symbolic significance, as agencies and landmarks for the guidance of wayfaring, mankind in its progress upward toward spiritual enlightenment and regeneration. For this reason, I feel I must touch upon this phase in my theme specifically, if only briefly, as I have shown by citations that forgeries were committed. I shall prove by explanations that our Bible is an Irish book of pre-Roman times and an out-and-out -out theft without acknowledgement from the Irish Church of Iessa. Any competent person who knows the Irish language cannot fail to recognize it. Our present version of the Bible, then, is an authorized adaptation from the original Irish scriptures with alterations and additions made from time to time by Roman and British churchmen in secrecy 
as they deemed it necessary and advisable to do so. The following agreement in the writings under the names of Matthew, Mark, and Luke regarding the impression made upon the people by the teachings of Jesus is an example which shows plainly the work of the forging priests. It would be impossible for such agreement to have occurred in the original writings of any three men writing individually and independently on any subject whatsoever. But in fabrication from the older works and collaborating, the priest scribe simply blundered and made each of the three witnesses write down and repeat the same identical expression in copy as to how Jesus impressed the people. Here's the forged testimony. Matthew says, they were astonished at his doctrine. Mark says, they were astonished at his doctrine. Luke says, they were astonished at his doctrine. Many authors and critics have commented upon and pointed out the inaccuracies and inconsistencies of the scriptures, and many of them have stated their firm belief that they were copied from older books, but none of them could obtain a clue beyond a surmise, which was far from the truth, and none of them was able to produce the real facts which were necessary to convince. But the work that they did was helped and made it possible to accomplish the desired end. They found so many flaws in it, which the jugglers did not cover up, that it kept the question open until the solution was found. The true source has escaped discovery until now. At least it has never before been disclosed to the knowledge of mankind as a whole. The Irish scriptures were altered and adapted to the scheme of the church. In order to make the fable of Iessa an historical and geographical, geographical fact, names from the scriptures were given to places in Syria during its occupation by the crusaders to bear this out. It also suited the purpose of British statecraft to obscure and suppress all evidence of the greatness and culture of the Irish nation. Than whom no people in the world's history have reached greater heights both spiritually and intellectually, nor have suffered greater injustice at the hands of priestly impostors or political oppressors. The men who were engaged in executing this literary fraud committed as well the audacious crime of completely effacing all evidence of credit due of credit due the Irish nation for the most brilliant and glorious service to civilization and human enlightenment. It almost passes belief that a fraud so stupendous could escape so long without discovery. But when we consider the thoroughness and extent to which the plot was carried out, and the magnitude of the forces which were employed in the work, it is not so much to be wondered at. Forces such as the Roman Empire, with its world power, then the Roman Catholic Church, and the British Kingdom, with propaganda systematically spread abroad in order to create a false impression of everything pertaining to the past history of Ireland and her people. These are the forces which have per perpetrated and profited by this great fraud. The deception is still continued and the secret jealousy guarded by both the Roman church and Britain from the world at large, but more particularly from the Irish people who have suffered so much from those two adverse forces. The men who executed this plot were acting jointly in the interest of both Rome and Britain even to this day, the British government does not encourage, even if it will allow, excavations or investigations to be made about the hill of Tara in Ireland. Reference Reverend Joseph Wilde in When the World Comes to an End. I will give two citations here, with more to follow, to show that the names of many of the characters in the Bible are plainly Irish. And it is because of this fact that the Irish Roman Catholic priests would not allow the Irish Catholics to read the Bible. They were told not to read it and, quote, that it was not a sufficient rule of faith. The real reason 
was that some of the Irish people might recognize the Irish names in a Jewish Bible and ask questions that might rec sorry and ask questions that it would embarrass them to answer satisfactorily. Nevertheless, it is a very astonishing thing that would that what now appears so clearly fraudulent could have escaped detection for so long a time. There are three main reasons for this. First, that the people are slow to attribute fraud and dishonesty to the clergy. Second, that the Irish Catholics who could speak the Irish language believed as they were told by the priests the Bible was brought to them from the outside instead of being of Irish origin. And being uninstructed in the principles of man's nature were not given to investigation or research for spiritual truth. And third, that the field of religious literature has been dominated by the works of professional preachers and other religionists who have kept up the delusion knowingly or who took it for granted that the published accounts of the origin of the scriptures were in the main true and were originally written in Greek with one single copy in Hebrew. As has always been asserted, it will therefore be a surprise to Bible readers of today who have had no suspicion of this deception to be told that it was through the medium of the Irish language that the true key would be found for the solution of the mystery of the origin of the Bible. The proof of this fact is here given for all mankind to see and know. Let me pause real quick and sip some water yeah. what are you thinking Eldon? i want to get your full analysis on this man because when i'm starting to a picture is emerging where you know he he alleges that the old testament the new testament you know the bible generally uh, is an irish book but for that to be true it would have to somehow connect back to the irish language and perhaps phoenicia and perhaps atlantis you know what i'm saying because what he's saying is that the Bible's older than what we're told. That's basically what he's saying. Yeah. And he's claiming that through the Irish language, he can prove that. And then yeah. the Irish language has connections to Phoenicia, I believe. And then if yes. we go back further, Atlantis. Yep. So that's the generalities of what I'm seeing here personally. Now, I want to get your analysis of this to kind of connect all those threads. The Irish are the closest descendants of Atlantis. That's an intuition of mine. And I say descendants because the ancestors of the Atlanteans were Finns. Finnish. They're the Finnish line. It all goes back to the Finns, to the Finnish. But what does Isaac Taylor tell us? That the Celts come from the Finns. So, if the Celts come from the original Nordic European people, they are the, you know, progenitors of all Northern European spiritual truths that have been saved through the ice age. And they're especially, you know, exalted because they're out close to the Atlantic like that. They did not, Ireland never got swept over by the Hun. They never got overswept by the Moors, right? They never got overswept by Rome. Ireland is perhaps the original indigenous Europeans today, Northern Europeans today. The Finnish people, which who I'm always pointing to and always saying, you know, the Finns, the Finns, the Finns, mm -hmm. they have a ton of Asian DNA because the Hun came through there, the Sami, the Eskimo type people. And the Irish people, if they've mixed with anyone, it's been a tiny bit of Native Americans and a tiny bit of black people. That's where they get, you know, the bouncy curly hair and the orange hair. To me, just a theory at this point, orange hair is a product of blonde mixing with a black person. That's interesting because you do see black people with red hair. That happens. Yeah. And when an Asian person mixes with the european you can get blonde but the red gene goes away 
you'll never yeah, see a yeah a, yeah so it's like it's almost like um rock paper scissors like asian like pin straight hair yeah beats out black hair dude what you're saying is true because almost every time but yeah. then irish genetics take like black mixed in with irish you get yeah. like these uh blake griffin looking like like, like yes exactly like lamello <laughs> lamello ball looking yeah okay like, that's funny. like uh but it's funny because like the people i know that are half asian none of them have red hair it's all yes no, no, that that red hair gene gets nuked. That's why Finland is the blondest place on earth, and Ireland is the reddest place on earth. Because mm -hmm. the Irish were the ones potentially mixing with the Native Americans and some Africans a, a little bit. You know, you have your black Irish. There is truth to that. I'm not on this way. We was Kang's, you know, BS about Ireland, but I will say that black Irish, whether it was a Spanish armada, whether it was one port that the Moors went to and did a lot of, you know, lovemaking, you get this uh, black Irish gene from somewhere like Sean Connery. Yeah. I have those, I have people like that in my family where it's like, we have our red hairs, we have our blondes, but we have some people that look like they're Cuban, but they're 100% mm -hmm. Irish. Yeah. And they stand out, especially because the Irish are so pale. You know, my dad was white. My dad could not tan. My dad just got pink. Mm -hmm. Could not tan. My brother is very, you know, fair skinned too. And um, the Irish are among the palest people in the world. Everyone knows that. And they just seem to have this original, like, Ice Age genetics, it seems. And the Finns still have that too, but they're, inf they're infused with a little bit of Asian. The Irish kept that. Perhaps the purest, you could argue, you know, with the RH negative measurements in Ireland, having the most RH negative blood, um, some of the most, especially in Ireland. They're like the Basque. They are spreading more with people across the Atlantic, probably, than, than anyone from the, um, you know, Eastern Europe or anything, Asians. So... That's why they're unique and they have a lot of red hair and bouncy curly hair. But let's keep going on. Let's keep, mm -hmm. keep it moving. Got to chip away at this. This stuff is zonkers, guys. Once he starts going through the names. Here we got some tips. Let me call them out. Sir Longo, thy followers request a Discord channel. Okay, make it. I ain't got time for that. I ain't got time for that AI chatbot. You know, seems like a loser spending time doing nothing. You guys can all talk to me on Instagram or whatever. You know, tune into the live chats. I'm not against it. I just don't have time for it. Make, make a Discord. Be the Discord mod. You can do it. You be the guy. Thank you for the two bucks. John Sup, 10 bucks for the super sticker. My beep, <laughs> my dude. <laughs> my black enjoy, Irish. Enjoy that super, that super sticker, super sticker, and um. So yeah, let's just keep, just keep moving it forward. Irish wisdom in the Bible. Where was I? I was uh. Okay, yes, to see and know. The first of the two citations to be given in this chapter is from the book of John. And, quote, And John was baptizing in Anon, near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. In the latest revision of the Bible, the, quote, doctors have altered the word Anon to, and have made it, Enon. In the older version, it is Anon. This is a compound of two Irish words. An, meaning a circle of the sun, a year, and on, also a name of the sun. The complete word itself means the sun. 
The word on also signifies cause, reason, swiftness, fierceness, eagerness, excellent, noble, good, also wolf dog. These are qualities and attributes associated with and applied to the solar sun and to the sun god by the Aryan or Irish priests of Iessa. Their theology was based on the idea that the supreme deity never had nor has a name. He is known only by attributes as the good or God, holy, most high, etc. And as the solar sun is the center of light and his great representative, or sun in our system, the sun god is named after the qualities and attributes of some ideas, such as the horseman or charioteer, the strong one or Samson, or the fierce one, Horus, the heavenly wolf who is eager, swift and fierce. The Irish during their sojourn in Egypt gave the name of On to one of their cities on the Nile. The city of On, or On, the city of the sun, was afterwards called Heliopolis by the Greeks and Romans. Salem is a Hebrew word, but the basis of it is in the Irish word solas, light, as Hebrew is a jargon of the Irish. Catch that, guys. As Hebrew is a jargon of the Irish. What is Gibraltar uh, signify? You have Portugal is named for the port to Gaul, Gaelic, you know, the Gales, the Gauls, port to Gaul. That's where you'd leave the Mediterranean, and the Phoenicians had their port to Gaul on the way back to Britain. Britain, let it be written. The Druids, the people who drew it up, the Picts. If you want a picture, wait, there's another one to this. Let it be written. The Druids. Shit, there's one more. Gauls, Gaelics. Well, I'm just saying, you know, Druid drew yeah. it up. Yeah. Well, the Phoenicians may have created the fanatics, perhaps. Yeah, so. and I'm saying all that because the Phoenicians, we're told, is where we get the alphabet, mm -hmm. guys. So there's a lot to this. This is not just like Irish wish, wishful thinking, you know which who knows it may be, but I'm a believer in this guys. I'll show you why as we keep going with the names, the evidence becomes stronger and stronger question. Everything. Thanks for the five pounds. Is it true that the prophet Muhammad had red hair, pale complexion and could well have been of Nordic origins? I mean, Hey, I never met the guy, but from what I've been Told and seen, they've got his hair and it's red. He's written as having red hair. His his wife or sister had blonde hair, one of them. And a lot of the original higher-ups had red hair. They still dye their beards red in a lot of those countries and their head hair too, in veneration of Muhammad's red beard, probably of the Phoenician origins too, a little tip of the hat to the Phoenician dye, things like that. Who knows? You know, Islam is not something I know a ton about at all. But uh, here, let's keep it moving. You're doing good on time? Oh, you're muted. Um, yeah, I think we're good on time. I mean, we got at least... 45 minutes till the two hour mark. So I, I'm really interested in what else Mr. McDari has to say. Sure. Yeah. So okay. Where was I? <clears throat> Near to Salem. The meaning of this myth is that John or a in the sun was baptizing in Anon, the city of the sun, near to Salem, the city of God, in the realm of light, the celestial kingdom. 
Where else could such a being as the pure and perfected man be said to dwell? In myth, John or Aeon, Eon or Ain, three forms of the word and all pronounced Ain, represents the deemed, redeemed and glorified man. Man at the highest stage of spiritual attainment, next to the messianic state, so that in his succeeding life or incarnation, here again on earth, he will be the Messiah. In the Irish mythic narrative of the Bible, we see that after John, the prophet and holy man, comes the perfected man God, the Messiah, Iessa, or Jesus. This is an example of the esoteric truth and wisdom which lies hidden beneath the veil of the, of the scriptural allegory as formulated by those inspired Irish adepts. And though they have been denied the credit of authorship through the thieves' compact of silence, their wisdom and their works still exist in both the Bible and the great pyramid of Iessa. The second citation to prove that the Bible is Irish, purely and unmistakably so, and I defy contradiction, is taken from the books of Mark and Samuel. The Pharisees questioned Jesus because the disciples plucked ears of corn on the Sabbath. He said, quote, Have ye never read what David did when he had need? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiah. Abiathar, the high priest, and did eat the shrew bread, which is not lawful to eat, but for, but for the priests. The first book of Samuel contains this version of David and the shrew bread. Then came David to Nob, to Ahimelech, Ahimelech, the priest. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no other bread there but the shoe bread that was taken from before the Lord. The foregoing is but a cryptic allusion to the perfecting work of the initiate who is engaged in the effort of eradicating from his nature, all worldly ambitions and the desires of the flesh for the development of his higher self, the solar body, the God within himself. The word Abiathar, Abiathar, the name of the high priest, is such a plain and easily recognized Irish word that even the uneducated Irishman or Scotsman who, may, who is able to speak Gaelic can understand it and will recognize it at once as a word of Irish or Gaelic speech. It is a compound of two words. The word ab means lord or father, and athar is also the word for father. The two words combined would literally be father, father. The literal sense of two, the literal sense of it would be head father. For the word ab is also applied to the head of a monastery. But the esoteric sense of it is, but the esoteric sense of it is high father or God. The vowel letter, I is introduced to connect the two words into one. The Roman British scribe in this instance gives us a compound Irish word. And of course, without the least suggestion that such is the case, makes a play on the name and presents it to us in the English version of the Bible as the name of the Hebrew high priest. It is a decide, sorry, It is a priest <clears throat> it is a priestly deception, as will be seen readily, on the part of the transcriber of Mark, when we understand that the character, David, and the incident connected with him is but a story invented for the purpose of containing an idea, as follows. Abiathar, in this allegory, alludes to the high father God manifesting spiritually through the solar sun in his human counterpart, which is the solar 
or luminous spiritual body of the initiate. David, who is on the upward path, striving for the victory of the spirit over matter in the material body or flesh. This should be instructive to every wayfaring man who is traveling eastward towards the dawn from darkness to light, into whose hands these pages may come, as well as to the general body of Bible readers. The copyist and transcriber who has given us the version ascribed to Samuel and, sorry, yeah, has David go to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest. The word Nob is Irish and is spelled Nob, N-O-E-B, but it is pronounced as if it were Naev. With the Irish, fuck, with the O having a short sound as O, if the word was written by the priests without the intent to deceive, they would have presented it to us in this form, knob, the dot over the B making it V or V, which in the Irish has the sound of V. They have taken advantage of the alphabetical features of the Irish language to perpetrate a fraud on the people of the world. The word knob means heaven, sacred, or holy. The word Ahimelech means the heavenly king or solar sun, who is figuratively a champion, hero, or ruler. Melchizedek is another form of the word from the same root. The letter A is pronounced broad as if it were all. The letter H is added to it for an aspirate to soften it. Together they form a prefix, melech. Sorry, together they form a prefix. Melech is the Hebraized, Hebrewized, however you want to say that, Hebraized or jargonized form of the Irish word meal, an animal or ideal for the sun. As the sun moves swiftly, it is in imagination, meal an animal. It is the figurative name given to the sun by the Irish priests of Iessa. Therefore, the sun is called Mielku, pronounced Melku, a greyhound. It is also called Onchu, Onku, a wolf. Hence, the terms applied to the sun, the swift one, the fierce one, the greyhound and the wolfhound, however, been favorites with the Irish and figure in their legends and fables. We see the same deception practiced by the Irish Roman priesthood upon the Irish Catholics of our own day in the word Melko, a name of the personified son. He is the fictitious person to whom in the story St. Patrick was sold as a slave thus proving to us again that the lying and dishonest priests of Rome wrote a false and worthless history for the Irish people. They are the people who stole the ancient Irish Bible and palmed it off on the world as a Jewish book, produced by a people over in Syria. It is an invention and an imposture on the world. The Irish word for wolf dog is on Hence, the Irish priests of Iessa, during the sojourn of the Irish race in Egypt, give the name to a city on the Nile. They have also applied the name Onku, the wolf, to the sun. Therefore, we have the heavenly wolf Osiris, meaning the high eastern sun, from Os, high, and Sor, pronounced Sur, and meaning east. Hence the morning sun. He is Horus, the risen, from the Irish word or aspirated to hor. Bombshell. Hang on. But that was a bombshell, dude. What he's basically saying is that the Old Testament is not Hebrew. Yes. It's nope. it's Irish. Well, Hebrew, what does that even mean? I was talking about Gibraltar. In Portugal, because uh, 
it's all right there in the names of places. That's why Isaac Taylor was so ahead of everyone. He was into the names of places, toponymous names of places. And he believed, and others, you know, that I can prove to, to people, you get Gibraltar from G-I-B-R. In Spain, what are they called there? Iberian. Iberian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. What do they call, what's another name for ancient Ireland? Hibernian. Hiber. Hiber. Heber. Hibernian. H-I-B-E-R. Now, Eber, Hebern, when you look at Gib Gibraltar, G goes soft in Spanish and Latin. So the G goes soft, and that's Heber, altar, the Hebrew altar, Gibraltar. That's why gibberish, if something is gibberish, it's, you're saying it sounds like Hebrew to you. It's the same word. Heber, Jeeber, Jeepers Creepers. <laughs> so gibberish is Hebrew. I'm not making this up. Look it up yourself. The G goes soft, I and E, same noise, and then the B and the R. Okay. And there's more, there's more there. I'm just quickly, you know, uh, clinking those together. But, oh yeah. So, the Irish have been labeled Hebrew for a long time. Hebrew. Hebrew. Hibernian. And, you know, all the places you have, the Phoenicians, that's the Finnish. You have the Assyrians, the Osir of the Vikings, the Osir, the high gods, of the Norse. Then you have the Scythians, the Scuti, the Scotti, people of the Scythe. Well, those are also Northern Europeans. So all the people who directly, you know, inspired Hebrews, whoever you think that is, Hebrew, Jewish, whatever word you're going to use, ancient Israelites, you know, it's always important. It's intentionally sticky and slippery to use the right words. It's so, so confusing. Mm -hmm. But whoever preceded the Jews of the Bible were Assyrian, Scythian, Phoenician. Okay. This is where the Jews get their culture. Scythian, much of it. Finnish, sorry, Phoenician, much of it, their alphabet. And then the Assyrians, the Osir, and the Babylonians, and this and that. All of those three major groups of people who precede the Hebrews and their Abrahamic faiths go back to Northern Europe. So I don't know what people are talking about saying... Abrahamic faiths are a Jewish creation or Christianity is a Jewish, you know, side mission. No, 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 no. You're just haven't, you haven't done the homework. You're too lazy to go check the facts. You'd rather be all riled up and run at the, at the red, you know, red cape that the, the Zionist masters are throwing into the, school textbooks uh, sorry it's not true christianity is a if not of european origin is of polar origin the cross is cross in the sky that's not unique to, to jesus that's not unique to to the middle east so every way you look at it judaism is not the progenitor of christianity not the way that people think it is okay Christianity was has been hijacked as much as any other faith can be. You know, the, the Bible does not claim to be like the one book that proves everything and is so different from everything else. No, it just says Bible, the book, the book. It's just the one book that this is our best job. This is our best job summing up all our myths together and putting it together. And people say, people complain about books being taken out of the Bible. Um, What's your favorite movie? Well, guess what? It had some scenes taken out of it. And that uh, that director really didn't want to have to. But guess what? 
something has to hit the cutting board, the cutting room floor, you know, something has to get trimmed. The geniuses don't get to put every single idea they've ever had, every truth that, that can ever be uttered into one book. You're asking for too much. You're too entitled. You know, Christianity is as good as it gets. Now you can obscure where you're at in the spiritual path by, by saying, oh, you know, all my Indian beads and here's my Buddhist, you know, this and this and just cover your bukkake yourself with like metaphysical garbage. And you can obscure where you're at in the path. But people always come into my store and saying, oh, you know, the resets and, you know, um, the Phoenix event and the resets and the incubator babies and the clowns and the mech. And I'm like, where's it all going, dude? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Where's it all going? Mm -hmm. Where does Jesus fit into this? You know, I had a conversation with a good guy today, really cool guy today who came and popped in. And some people just need Jesus, dude, Zeus. I don't, I don't, you don't need the beggar on the street riding a donkey, Zeus, Jupiter, whatever way you're going to look at it. Mm -hmm. um if you want to take a holy allegorical approach whatever as soon as i say to people what about jesus they go oh i just don't like that organized christianity who said anything about organized christianity if you read his own words stay out of churches stay out of you don't need to worship indoors you don't need a preacher okay meditate turn to yourself fast like i did he's the most transcendental enlightened wizard there's ever been if he were a real person you know and the the timeless argument is you know i mentioned today to that my buddy ryan who came in here earlier uh every religion exalts jesus mm -hmm. jesus was not exclusively the messiah or enlightened one of judaism he was the Messiah of every religion. He reached what they, what every religion considers spiritual attainment. And you can say, oh, well, he learned that in India. Oh, he actually went here and no one knows about it. Okay, whatever. You know, have your cake and eat it too. You can look at it any way you want. All religions venerate Jesus. Jesus only venerated himself and his father. So my money's on him, okay? Astrologically, astrotheologically speaking, literally speaking, any way you look at it, if you're restricted to the literal interpretation, it's still the best out there. If, you're, if you have access to the astrotheological interpretation, it's the best and most well put together. And it's the most, you need a true literal story to build an allegory out of. You can't have the world's greatest allegory there's ever been and then have it be made from BS. And I said earlier today, today we're very preoccupied. We're very cursed with an obsession for facts instead of truth. We want fact, 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 no truth. I'm guilty of it. It's all fact-based, very little truth. Christianity, this whole debate between allegorical, literal, I promise you, if you're not getting facts, you're at least getting truth. You're getting 100% astrotheological wisdom, truth. Yeah, man. I think that if Jesus is a personification of the sun, let it be. That's awesome because man is a social animal, a social creature. And if there's, <laughs> if there's a man who does represent the sun, that's just one layer of this story. And that's, yeah. well, that's the way I look at it. There's the astrological layer. There is a, a potential man and other characters in the Bible that represent other things astrologically. And I never, I never eliminate the possibility that it's all literally true, that I'm not one of those people that says, oh, Jesus wasn't a historical person. I think it's likely that he was um, because I, I just see it as one layer to this, to this book, yeah. the book. You see what I'm saying? So people yes. get caught up in these layers and I'm like, yo, there's all these different layers. And it's like, I see Christianity as a framework 
in which I reside. And if other people are also in that framework, it's going to be an amazing uh, society. It's going to be an amazing culture, amazing town, amazing city. And uh, I'd like to say real quick, you you briefly mentioned sort of the, the retardarian nar- narrative. And what that narrative does is it sort of separates European people from cathedrals. You didn't build those cathedrals. Your ancestors didn't build those cathedrals. You guys aren't capable of building uh, those cathedrals. Um, shut the fuck up, maybe, um, because that's the bottom line to to that narrative. It's like, no, we're not having it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Tartarians were actually three foot tall black people who had attained every technological advancement there's ever been. Yeah. Then they got really sick one day by by accident and an a- asteroid took them out. And then all us incubator clown people, Nephilim babies, white people, came and just found all the beautiful buildings. And whoa, look at the trolleys and the all the indigenous wisdom. And cut me a break. Exactly. <laughs> I think it's, it's like these people's minds are mud flooded. Like, are you? Yes. Oh, no, no. Dude, the mud flood, dude, I've been I've been weaving this together. The mud flood yeah. is people who are literally compacted with shit, with feces, yeah. Who, yeah. who are up to their eyelids in feces. Yes. Who have who are never going to get this whole flood that they're thinking of is the yeah. colonic that they are in desperate need of. OK, oh, wow. Jesus was a colonic freak. You can think it's gross. You can think it's weird. Well, that's probably the Zionists who've made you think that way, thinking, mm-hmm. oh, it's weird to be squeaky clean and healthy and parasite free. Oh, who is Jesus uh, um, preaching against? The Pharisees? Oh, you mean the Pharisees? The parasites? Pharaoh? Paro? Mm-hmm. To impair? Impair your sight? Mm-hmm. Parasites? Okay, the mud flood community is the least sp- spiritually. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. yeah, we have no ancestors. There, we're just we just came from fucking yep. uh, incubators and shit. Are you serious? You we crawled. I mean? We collectively crawled out of a, a like rock, you yeah. know. Yeah. We, we we dodged a nuclear blast and just came up and all this wonderful technology was waiting. Yeah. Gross. We just inherited it. Yeah, mud flutters are compacted, guys. They um their mental faculties have been impaired. They all have the mud flood face. Uh, you know, like they're just yeah. They need to repent. And ask God for forgiveness. <laughs> they really do. Like, I think that's so. not a bad idea. <laughs> and the thing is, dude, doing that, uh, forgiving other people, th- that's physiologically healthy. You know what I mean? I mentioned on the last show that there's a huge, and you were just mentioning right now with the, the parasite, Pharisee uh, allegory metaphor, that the Bible and Christianity generally is very healthy. Oh, so super. I feel like forgiveness is healthy. Asking People, God for forgiveness is healthy. Yeah. Oh, it's so it's humbling, guys. Someone like me and Al Dog over here, we need a dose of humility, you know. And yeah. Jesus is the ultimate like rectifier of you know ego things like that. You know, you're always that's the number one thing. People hate Jesus because they hate the fact that someone's above them. They hate that someone reached a spiritual a degree of spiritual attainment that they can never even fathom. They hate that it was probably a European dude. They hate that it that it was a man. They hate that it was um, someone just better. You know, it's like being it's like being a vegetarian. You know, if I'm just trying to convince someone, yeah. they go, "Oh, you think you're so better than me." You think you're so better than, you know, you think you're better than people. And it's like, well, if I'm trying to be healthier, like, isn't that the pursuit? Like, is better bad? Or are you for real? But whatever. Well, dude, I've been actually thinking about that, the the, um, vegetarian thing, because I live up north. I live in Massachusetts. 
I live in hell, uh, you know, four to five months out of the year. And when you do live in hell, you end up kind of becoming a beast to survive. And, yeah. you know, eating meat is part of that. So it's like, um, I've never had an open mind about vegetarianism without the Garden of Eden uh, explanation. So it's like, while I'm up here in hell, the vegetarian thing, it would be hard for me to pull off. However, if I was in like Florida or Georgia or something like that, I think it'd be way, way easier because, you know, you're getting nutrients from the sun. You're, uh, you know, you're just not in hell anymore. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's winter is the cause of man's desire to eat animals, you know, plainly, plainly put, um, we got some more tips. Appreciate it, guys. You guys love big, big old crowd tonight, man. Let's go. People yeah, love. Dude, it's. I think it. Part of it might be because my Twitter is growing. I grew like two hundred followers, two hundred followers tonight at least, and I yeah. just retweeted it. So, for real, Al Dog hit a home run earlier, guys. Yeah, shit's booming. Um, question everything. Five pounds. Oh, we already read that. Dina. Dena, Dina, nine ninety nine. The celestial kingdom makes sense. People who've done boots on the ground in the British Isles and Wales have discovered land in celestial shapes. Hmm. Interesting. I'm big into the the Welsh, you know, Kimeroglyphics, Sumeroglyphics, however you say it. C Y M R O glyphics with Ross Broadstock and. Uh, Wilson and Blackett or whatever their names are. And, um, I love that stuff. That's like my interest. Like I'm, I don't make, I have my Irish video, but I'm not going to, you know, how quick can I learn Welsh and Irish and all that stuff. But Ross Broadstock, super smart guy, may have been heart attacked, Clinton style, live on YouTube. Terrible fucking... Dude, this is nuts. Terrible thing to happen. I caught it within like a couple of days of it happening. He was live streaming. This dude who just blows the lid off. Like he's like the modern Connor, modern day Connor McDarry, pretty much. So he was talking about a lot of this stuff as well, and he died on a live stream, is what you're saying. He died. He got a had a heart attack yeah. on a live in the middle of a live stream mm -hmm. and then turned his live stream off and then legit died. Whoa. And he exclusively talked. Now, to be fair, he wasn't like, you know, he was an average 50-year-old guy. You know, he was not in the greatest shape. I'm not yeah. saying he couldn't have had a heart attack, but look into it, guys. Go support Ross Broadstock. Ross Broadstock. He's super, super good. But um, Celestial Kingdom. Shelly, yeah, thanks, Dina. 999. Oh shit, boy! Let's go. Fifty bucks, brimming with delight. Thank you very much. Thank you for the super sticker. Enjoy, enjoy the fifty dollars super sticker. Thank you. I don't even know what the super stickers are. I think it just means like a fifty bucks and above, maybe. I don't. I don't know what a super sticker is either. I have no clue. I I literally don't know. I hope you enjoy it though. Thank you very much for the support. For Thank real. You. Croom, what's up, JC? 1649, Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell. Crom, that's his ancestors. Cromwell, invasion of Ireland and the adoption of the 1611 King James Bible from the Geneva to hide Irish influence in Christianity. Well, who knows? I think the King James Version is good. That's the original Irish, or sorry, English, original English. Um, Connor McDory probably won't, won't, won't agree with that, but I love the King James Version from a sacred geometry point of view. Like the people who put that thing together were genius linguists, Kabbalists, people who had your best interests at heart, if I dare say who were very smart and were looking for a avenue to show off how smart they were. And the Bible was a good opportunity. Everything that didn't fit or didn't make sense or wasn't true to like the 
Abrahamic traditions was tossed into the complete works of William Shakespeare. So everything that was too lewd or, you know, characters wouldn't fit that went into Shakespeare. But your Bible is as good as it gets, guys. Astrological wisdom, all this stuff. I want to keep reading, finish off this Connor McDarry thing. Yeah. Thanks for the 10 bucks, Krim. 20 bucks, Longo, my beach. Does Tuath de Danan have any foundation with the Irish? Yeah, they're Irish. There's another one, Tuath. You know, it's like Thoth, Danan, Danish, tribe of Dan. So many people have talked about this. They are Irish, yeah. If that, if not, they're Finnish. Finnish or Irish. And the Finns, this is something Connor McDory talks about in this book. The F Irish are the Phoenicians because the Phoenicians were known as Finns and the Irish were known as Finns. To this day, Finn is one of the most popular Irish names that there is. Wow. And, and it's featured in many Irish names like Finnegan. Finnegan. So, thank you for the 20 bucks. Appreciate it, John. Adriano, Optimistic Bear. Can I, thanks for the five Canadian dollars. No, 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 bro. Five candy dollars, you can shove that candy money, you know, up your beep, up your syrup, syrup hole. <clears throat> your your syrup, syrup sucker. Thank you, Adriano. I'm only kidding. Thanks for the five dollars. That might be more worth more than American. Who knows? Doctor Longo, you should talk with Awar. The Christ gravy between you two would be great. Thanks for all your work. God bless. Hmm. That's quite interesting. Yeah. We'll leave. We'll just leave it at that. Thank you for the five bucks. You know. Who knows? I think you might. Who knows? Something might work out there. Never know. Appreciate the tip. Like where your mind's at. But we're going to be moving on. Thank you, Adriano. Good luck getting out of Canada, man. Make it to Florida. So, Wolfhound, we were talking about them. Okay. They are the people who stole the ancient Irish Bible and palmed it off on the world as a Jewish book produced by a people over in Syria. It is an invention and an imposture on the world. The Irish word for wolf dog is on. Hence, the Irish priests of Iessa during the sojourn of the Irish race in Egypt. Or I think I already said this. The risen from the Irish word or aspirated to hor, meaning a lord or savior. One to whom prayer is offered. The word also means from whom in the sense of descent. Hence we find the Horus. Hence we find the Horus or that Horus is the son of Osiris. In the mythical idea, the sun is Osiris in the early morning and he becomes Horus, the risen sun and savior. In the early forenoon, in the early forenoon. He is the wolf Horus at noon when his rays are hot and oppressive. Also, Typhon, the evil one. He is the Lord and Savior given to the Egyptian people to worship by the Irish priests of Oiesa. Here are the facts that defy contradiction. The Irish language is the treasure house in which these indisputable proofs exist for everyone who wishes to view them. With the truths disclosed in these pages, mankind is confronted with a new and altered viewpoint, which gives us a new conception of history. The priest and churchman has imposed upon the credulity of the professor. A new perspective opens before us, and scholars and honest-minded men and women must address themselves to the task of straightening out the confused and unreliable accounts of the past which have emanated from such obviously self-interested sources as Rome and Britain. Ahimelech, then, like Abiathar, is God, 
in his aspect of the solar king or sun, whose divine human aspect is the perfected man. Therefore, in this myth, we are told that David ate the shewbread. That is, he received the sacred wisdom of the priests, practiced abstemiousness and self-denial, and came into a state of holiness from which he advances to the perfect or messianic state. And so, from the advancing David, the Messiah is born. Hence, Jesus is said to be born of the house of David. Thus it is to the Irish magician adepts of the ancient religion of Iessa that we are indebted for the knowledge of these esoteric spiritual truths preserved under the veil of allegory and myth. The distinction and renown which the Magi, Magi give to Ireland, which island in mythology is, which island in mythology is referred to as Isle of the Blessed, has been taken to herself by Rome, as if it had come about since her ministration there. Hence, the allusion made by her priests to Ireland as the island of saints, that is, Roman saints. Those great men developed the powers of the soul and became godlike, while their Roman successors have become renowned for their capacity for acquiring stocks and bonds, and become distinguished according to their ability as investors. They have denied to the ancient Irish masters of wisdom all acknowledgement of their indebtedness and blotted out so far as they could the very memory of their existence, ascribing their erudition and wisdom to others, and they mention them only to traduce them. They covertly refer to them as the snakes, which St. Patrick banished from the Ireland. While the multitude is taught to believe that it was the creeping reptiles of the dust that he banished, the latter never did exist in Ireland. They do not apply to them the dignified term of serpent, which is the symbol of wisdom, but snakes to imply what is low and evil. Baseness could go no further. The Irish race has suffered humiliation even to this day through this willful traduction and careful directed perversion of their history. Fables have been invented and taught to the people as genuine facts and bona fide history. The writer has, like others, absorbed a lot of their fiction and must confess it was some task to unlearn it and to adjust his mind to the reception of even obvious truths, which conflicted with pious untruths. It is certainly a preposterous thing to allow a body of pretentious impostors to instill their falsehoods into the minds of the growing youth. Moreover, the political priesthood insults our intelligence by considering themselves solely as God's anointed, with his special favorites. We are told that in England and Ireland, it was the practice to give the priests in many places a number of shares of distillery stock as provision for their future. The priests speak of their churches as plants, just as if they were factories, and they are fitted up with slot receptacles to to catch any fractional currency, which might either by advice or suggestion be enticed from the pockets of their worshipers. It is safe to say that light is advancing and that truth is progressing, regardless of this reaction, regardless of this reactionary force, which is now exposed for the first time in a manner which reveals their plot. It cannot help but open the eyes of mankind to the great fraud, and more especially awaken the Irish people who have been so foully betrayed and sold into the hands of their oppressors. In the citations which I have given to show and prove that the Bible is an Irish book, the names of places and the names of characters given show plainly the direct connection with and their derivation from the Irish. The elucidation of the Great Pyramid and of the topic Egypt will add to this proof so that anyone who comes with open mind and unbiased judgment will not fail to see it. 
every lover of truth, qualified to judge, will be convinced that the names are Irish and only slightly changed in the form and spelling, changed only enough to deceive the unsuspecting. It is seldom that a man arises outside the ranks of the clergy who develops a knowledge of the elements upon which the religious myth is constructed. To solve the mystery of the origin of the Bible, this knowledge and that of the Irish language, combined with a true perspective of history, was necessary. It required also a true insight into, pff, nobody can see farther than me, by the way. I have some of the best vision on planet Earth. I'm standing like six feet back from my computer. So forgive me if if I uh, mess up. But Dude, dude, dude. I had a major breakthrough though. Okay. So yeah. they, they were saying that serpents are a metaphor for knowledge, for wisdom. You know, yep. as wise as serpents, as they might say. Yeah. And so then I think of St. Patrick and the snakes leaving Ireland. It's almost as if they're saying they took the knowledge out of Ireland. Yes, that's a good point. What he said there, it's a good distinction, is serpent implies wisdom, but snake is lowly and base. Mm -hmm. So snake is where you get sneak. Mm -hmm. Snake is where you get, you know, snitch or um, snooky, you know, <laughs> uh, snake. It's just, it's not like a flattering right. con concept. So snake is the kind of a... Uh, it's like saying, the lower form. Serpent would be like a high-ranking fucking yes. snake. Yeah. And serpent also goes back to seven. Serpent, sept. That's an Irish thing too that he, he talks about in this book. And my Irish video talks about Oof. Damn. That sept is an Irish word. And sept, you get serpent from sept, September. And or septuant. And serped, you know, usurped is you you see this with the falling of the sun and the setting of the sun. And seven being Libra, the seventh sign of the Zodiac, being an especially vilified sign of the Zodiac because the sun sets there. Venus rules there, so that's the that's the temptation. And then Saturn exalts, so that's Satan, the evil one. And that's all in Libra, which is also where the sun sets, and you could say dies or is defeated. And, and that's um, why you get all this evil... Evil is the evening, also Libra, because it's the evening of the Zodiac. It's the midway point, halfway between the Zodiac. But also it's the scales, one half of the Zodiac here, the other half there, it's the middle point. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'll keep going. Um... <clears throat> It required also a true insight into Ireland's past and the villainous intrigues of the Roman and British priesthoods and the role they played in shaping events of momentous consequence in world affairs. To conceal those facts from p posterity, they had recourse to the scheme of falsifying the world's history and substituting therefore a tissue of lies and inventions. The British propaganda has been fostered by the Government Board of Education and such misleading works as Penix, Catechism of History and Ireland, which were put into the Irish school system. Persecution and propaganda have served the purpose intended and have caused the Catholic Irish to place an almost blind belief in the integrity of their priests who are a part of the Roman Church and ably doing the work of Rome and carrying on this deception, while the English churchman has done his part in the same end, namely to keep knowledge of Ireland's great past history under cover of oblivion. The Irish Catholics were directed away from a study of the Bible instead of towards it and made to depend on what the priests saw fit to dole out to them. Otherwise, it is reasonable to suppose that long before this day, 
some Irish-speaking person could not have failed to desert the idiomatic Irish in the very warp and woof of the Old Testament. It is an undeniable fact that the Irish-speaking Roman Catholics were not frequent readers, much less students of the Bible. I have laid some stress on this phase of my theme, but not inordinately. So considering that I am announcing the greatest discovery in the history of all literature, that the Bible is Irish and of Irish origin. I am aware that this will be a shock and surprise to students and intellectuals in all the enlightened countries of the world to be shown that they have been made the victims of a fraud. It was bound to be discovered in time. For truth so evident could not be hidden forever from the minds that were free from bias. Anyone qualified to approach the truth could not fail to see it, even though the schemers were reiterating their claims through the press and from all the pulpits in Christendom. There is no doubt in the writer's mind that the inner circles in British statecraft and high church, as well as those of the Roman church in Britain and Ireland, are keenly aware of this truth and carefully guard the secret of their fraud. A few years ago, the writer read A History of Ireland by Thomas More, the famous poet and author, in which he bewailed the fact that at every turn in his quest for knowledge and facts, he found a conspiracy of silence and suppression. He produced his work and under just, he produced his work under just such discouraging conditions, but he rendered a service to posterity by publishing his observations of the attitude of those persons who were in a position to assist him in his search for facts, had they wished to do so. My studies and investigations have enabled me to discover facts and truths as presented here, and these truths will stand every investigation. It all goes to prove that even the cleverest forgers and falsifiers are not safe from exposure and discovery. So it is the case, so it is the case with the Roman and British forgers, although the imposition of the Savior Jesus and the substitution of him for Iessa brought great riches to the Roman church. It required a great and tremendous effort to succeed in making it appear to the world that he had an actual historical existence. The people were in a terrible state of ignorance and superstition, a condition which was favorable to the church in effecting this cherished idea. Her ambition to make that one project alone successful was the cause of inflicting untold misery and suffering upon the people of three continents during the wars of the Crusades, which were, which were instituted for that end. The Roman church was obliged to enlist practically all Europe in these wars. It is, it is estimated that there were two million lives lost in carrying out that scheme in the struggle to drive the Mohammedans out of Syria in out that in the 10th and 11th centuries it was during the occupancy of so-called holy land by the crusaders for a period of 87 years that rome gave the names to the localities and places there which are mentioned in the scriptures so we'll close there actually no we'll press on it it ends right up ahead and which names had not been before identified with such places during that time, they did everything that they thought necessary or that circumstances would permit in preparing the ground to place marks of identification about each locality, which was selected to be the birthplace or scene of activity of each of the mythical characters to whose fictitious existence special significance or prominence was to be given. Such, for instance, is the example of the patriarchal character, Abraham who they assigned to the land of Ur in Chaldea. Ur, this is where it gets piping hot, guys. Check this out. Ur is an idiomatic Irish word and means the sun, fire, and the east. The word also expresses an Irish idea or conception of heaven. Ur 
is connected with the fabulous Irish land, Tir Na Naog, the land of the young, or the land of perpetual youth. The meaning of Ur in this instance is fresh, green, plenty, new, not stale or old, liberal, the land of plenteousness, the heavenly kingdom, and Abraham himself is most obviously an Irish idea of the personified son. There can be no room for doubt as to this fact as he comes from Ur, the son. And to be true to Irish mystic form, each syllable of his name is a name of the son. The word Ab is an Irish name for father, and here signifies father or creator son. And Ra means the moving or revolving sun, and am means time. For the sun is the governor and lord of timing and regulator of the seasons. And furthermore, as Abraham is the sun, he comes from Ur in Chaldea. Chaldea is a mythical and fictitious name, falsely said to be of a country in Asia. The name is from the Irish word Kol, a veil, secret, hidden, meaning mystically the great unseen. A Kolti was an Irish religious ascetic of the worship of Ayesa, a seer. Abraham has two female consorts, one of whom he marries, she is Sarah, from the Irish word Sor or Sork, meaning delight, light, pleasure, bright, conspicuous, clear, or the day. The other woman was named Hagar, from the root word akor, meaning covetousness, desire. She represents the night. The letter H is only an auxiliary in the Irish alphabet and is used as an aspirate, but the doctors have used it as a regular letter for deceptive reasons in the formation of the name of this mythic character. And instead of using the letter C, they use G. These two letters in the old manuscripts were often used for one, for the other, indiscriminately. And so we have Hagar, and as she is desire, she is not Abraham's true wife, but his concubine. She bears him a son, Ishmael, the Irish, the Irish, Ayas Moal. Ayas is the son, and Moal means bald. The young son, or early morning son, is said to be bald as he has no rays until later. So Ishmael is the young or morning son, born of the night. So, in the Irish Bible myth, we find that Abraham, the son, has two wives, Sarah, the fair one, the day, and Hagar, the dark one, the night. Sarah is jealous of Hagar, the concubine, and has Abraham send her away. In the phenomena of nature, the day always sends the night away. Hmm. Okay. We'll end there, guys. Pick it up again with the Irish gravy next St. Patrick's Day. Just kidding. Sunday service every Sunday. Come catch some heavy dose of Christian Christ pilling. Okay. Yeah. Christ pill is the spiciest pill. It's the one that triggers the most people. Okay. For people think people think they're cool being a flat earther. Oh, everyone argues with me. Oh, yeah. Try being Christian. Try being a convicted Christian. Try being a you know, intellectual or like astrotheological, you know, minded Christian and having to deal with all the idiots who think they are 300 IQ because they've debunked Christianity or, oh, you know, it's here. Let's get rid of this. Thank you, Connor McDory. You know, it's just astrology, right? Mm -hmm. You know that, bro. 12 signs of the Zodiac, mm -hmm. you know, debunked, bro. Mm hmm. It's like they discover a lair and it's like yes. oh, debunked. Any lair I discover is a debunkery. 
I look no. for Dubunkaroo, you know? No, you, you, that's exactly right. Yeah, well, every layer they discover, they erase all the other layers. And they think that they are, they've reached pinnacle of understanding mm -hmm. by, by just piercing the astro, the illogical. I hate to say it, you know, people like Santos Bonacci. I don't, I wouldn't want to be where he is at this point in life. And what do I think? What would I point to the most? Mm -hmm. He's not right with, with, with Christianity. And uh, he would argue with that. He would say he has the truest understanding, but he leans too much on the astrological as if it's a debunking tool on the Christians and saying they are so dumb. They're so this, they're so that, you know, I, uh, there is something to Jesus. And, you know, Connor McDary right here is, is arguing, you know, for a seemingly holy allegorical Jesus. And that's okay. You know, we've got books like, uh, true Messiah, Apollonius of Tiana, who's potentially the real Jesus. Well, there was a guy whose name was Apollonius, son of the sun. That's his name, Apollonius, born in the right time period, born in the right area, documented traveling east and learning, going to the Hindu, you know, yogis and learning what they had, going to the, you know, all throughout the, the Greek tra transitioning into the Roman um, Empire, basically he he was greek roman empire but i think he was greek apollonius he did so many of the things we are told jesus did at the same time name with the same meaning we know he was flesh and bone and plenty of documentation and there's many people who are convinced that apollonius of tiana was a true historical Jesus around the time of birth in the same empire, doing the same deeds as Jesus. Apollonius of Tiana, go look that up. So, you know, find your own interpretation, but I can guarantee you the story is true. It's Dude, true on all levels. Yeah. I had a really significant thought today that relates to what you just mentioned. And that is generally truthers, um, I think within this next coming four years between 2024 and 2028, whatever that brings, I think that truthers can be susceptible to mental illness. And I think that faith, specifically Christianity, can provide a framework that prevents that. Because the thing with these devices, our smartphones and these computers, it's a lot of fucking information. And what I see right now happening it's a lot of truthers that don't have a framework that aren't grounded um, could go fucking nuts. Uh, I, mean, I mean that quite literally with uh, the technology, the information, and uh, a lack of uh, funnel to sort of discern that. And I'm serious. Like this, the next four years, five years, people are going to go a little batshit crazy, I, I see. And Santos, legend, but he's uh, he's not... Uh, within a great framework right now, and we will pray for him. And that's what I would encourage you all to do as well. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Just so you know. But yeah, I, I was thinking about that like all day, dude. Just like. Yeah, well, you know, I agree, man. I agree. And guys, give Christianity a chance. Christianity, what is what's it's in the name? You're just choosing christ as your path to enlightenment understanding you know morality i, I always forget that's kind of a function of religion is like teaching people morality you know some people need to kind of be taught and shown and have it expressed through words and what christ's teachings but jesus christ you're just choosing him as your yogi this is my guru. This is my guy. He's got everything, you know, any question, it's in the Bible. It's in the New Testament. Even if they are forgeries like Connor McDarr is saying, they're forgeries of the truest truth that's ever been uttered 
that's that's so worth forging that it's been forged thousands of years you know after the fact it's still being plagiarized that's some good stuff right there you know what i mean i i don't hear uh whatever you know it's meditation prayer is meditation this is it, it bewilders me it i'm always like dumbfounded i'm always when people say, oh, but, you know, what I'm, what I'm going to pray to God, I'm just going to sit there in my bed and pray to God. So all oh, the people, people are always so angry. We're talking about Christianity like it's their childhood, you know, anger, like their parents made them go to church or made them pray. And they're just so they can can't forgive their parents that they just take it out on Christianity. But they say, oh, what am I just going to pray? Um. Yeah, you ever heard of a mantra? You ever heard of meditation? Combine the two. That's that's prayer. You ever hear of you know self affirmation or asking the universe, manifesting? Oh, all this vague like sorcery. Oh, I I'm worshiping source. I only go to source. I don't go to God. I don't go to Jesus. Shut the hell up. You're praying to nothing. You're praying to a vacuum in space source no 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 write the address on the mail that you're sending out don't just you're writing a letter and you're just gonna what grump you know curl it up and toss it into a lake and you i'm addressing this letter to everything the source of everything no 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 address that letter right where it needs to go lord jesus christ by the way most of you can't bring yourself to utter jesus christ because you're riddled with demons Okay, and that's why, uh, you know, talking about Jesus makes me uncomfortable. Uh, you need a big dose of Jesus. For real. I, I've said it again. It's worth saying. Um, demons are, no, are not threatened by anything more than Jesus Christ. Demons recoil at his mention. They hate all mentioning of his greatness. They hate, no good. You guys get the deal, right? You get it, Al Dog. Love it, man. I think uh, that was a great show. So I'm looking forward to uh, Astro Chads on Friday. I hope people enjoyed this. I learned a lot. And uh, yeah, great, great Church of Atlantis, man. Awesome. I love it. Thanks for bringing the Irish gravy. And the athletics matter. You know, we're not just here to worship and you know we're meant we are we're, if god just wanted us to venerate him endlessly free of desire he would have just kept us in heaven he would have just no body you know what i mean like you came into a body to inhabit the body to master the earth to tread you know the earth is your treadmill guys like it's mind body spirit it's all three you, you gotta hit yeah. all three for sure wonderful all right we're gonna sign off here guys gonna get some uh, food thanks for the open minds thanks for tuning in lots of viewership i'm very happy to see that you know with a friend this isn't really like a fringe subject but for the truth community like this is like an uncomfortable you know pill to swallow for so many for some reason thank you guys all out there maybe i'm just wrong maybe you all maybe all my viewership is just like red-blooded southeastern american you know christians which i'm equally happy with but I'd love to get through to at least some people who are anti-Christian or anti, oh, it's anti-women, it's anti-indigenous wisdom, blah, blah, blah. We're going to sign off. Thank you, guys. Tune in to Astro Chaz, March 22nd, premiering. Thank you. Good night. Yeah. Go check out Al Dog. Subscribe, buy his book. Good night. God bless you.